All right. Good day, everybody. My name is Arayk Petrosian, and I want to start off by thanking everybody who's on this call. And uh, it's my honor and privilege to bring this information to you during these unprecedented and uncertain times. I think uh, aside from the global health crisis that's going on, the next biggest um, pandemic or epidemic going on is the financial illiteracy crisis in our country and quite frankly across the world. And through this presentation, I hope to uh, answer some questions and I hope to inspire you to take a little bit of action towards your financial success and seek out options that may not be offered to you through your job, through your employer or through your financial advisor or anyone who is helping you with your money. And so uh, I am a licensed uh, agent and a registered representative. Uh, I do hold some designations and the information I'm bringing to you um, is definitely under a lot of scrutiny and a lot of uh, microscopic uh, analysis by FINRAs and SECs and departments of insurance. And so all of the information contained in this presentation is for conceptual purposes only. None of this information is a recommendation of any sort of investment or advice. And quite frankly, uh, comparing the two things we are about to compare today is frowned upon. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't discuss this enough because um, it's just not uh, allowed, I guess, so to speak, because of compliance issues. So um, Index Universal Life, let me start off by saying, is not an investment. It is a life insurance policy. And by term and invested difference refers to buying term life insurance and investing in difference in the mutual fund. Now, why are we discussing these topics today? Because I believe that um, the strategy that you use to build wealth ultimately will determine if you end up being wealthy or if you been, be, end up being average and ordinary. And I'm sure you've always pondered the question, just like I have, of why the rich keep getting richer and the poor stay the same or get worse. And so uh, through this presentation, I believe I'll be able to answer some of those questions. But when it comes to uh, planning, saving, investing, growing, building wealth, I think the wealthy do it a little bit differently compared to the average Joe or Josephine. So let's get right into my presentation today. And hopefully through this presentation, you will learn something new and walk away with better financial literacy. So um, when it comes to financial success, what is most important? What's most? Why do the rich keep getting richer? I think because they understand these few important uh, aspects then and they look at these things when they are making a decision whether to take advantage of something or not. And I think the most important thing when it comes to financial success, the three most important things, of course, are number one, managing your rate and managing your risk. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, there are many types of uh, investments out there, fixed accounts, variable accounts, indexed accounts, and all of these accounts offer a certain percentage return on your money, whether it's an average rate of return, whether it's a fixed rate of return, um, they're all offering you uh, some sort of percentage rate of return, true? And so managing that and understanding how that works uh, is important. The next thing, of course, is risk, which I think most people do not understand and underestimate. And quite frankly, there are many, many risks that can hold you back from accomplishing your dreams of financial success. So the, the second thing that I think is important is understanding the impact of losses. Right now we're in an economy where it is very highly, it is highly volatile, highly uh, unpredictable. And so managing losses and making sure you don't lose money in, a, in an economy like this is very important and understanding what those negative interest rates really mean. Right. What does it mean when you take a negative 35 percent hit in 2020? What does it mean when you take a negative uh, 40 or 50 percent in 2007, 8, 9? What does it mean when you take a massive uh, hit during the dot com bubble? Right. What does that mean? Is it is it OK to wait it out and let your investments come back or are you losing something there more than just uh, value? Right. And then finally, understanding number three, the inf uh, the impact of inflation and taxes on your future dollars. I think these three things are what wealthy people really focus on um, versus uh, a company match or a certain benefit through their job. And that's why the rich keep getting richer and, and the average stay the same. So let's get right into.
into it, let's talk about these two different strategies that people use to accumulate wealth and um, how they work and who's using them, who's advocating them, how they work in theory, how they work in practice. And then we'll do a complete analysis and summarize our findings here. So um, first, let's discuss and so let's set some framework for all the discussions we're going to have. Now, risk is something that can definitely hold us back from achieving our goals and dreams of financial success. And what kind of risks are there? Well, what you're looking at here is a risk quadrant, right? There are physical risks, financial risks, environmental risks, personal risks, and all of these risks can really uh, set you back when it comes to accumulating wealth. And I'm not going to go into too much detail here. You can take a snapshot of this, but um, imagine having a, a strategy that addresses only one area of this risk quadrant and then being totally exposed in the other three areas, right? That wouldn't be a good strategy, uh, in my opinion. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is, you know, understanding interest rates, you're uh, managing your rates and understanding the impact of losses and how that really, uh, how that average interest rate is really an illusion. You know, I talk to a lot of people and they'll tell me, you know, I, I get X amount of, I get 12% interest in my 401k. And I tell them that, you know, average interest rates you're talking about, they can be an illusion. And uh, it, in my opinion, it's more important to not lose money in the markets rather than to get those higher interest rates. And Warren Buffett says it the best, right? He says the first rule of investing is don't lose money. The second rule is don't forget rule number one. And so looking at this table here and comparing a variable account to an index account, now these numbers are totally made up. They're for conceptual purposes only. But if you look at the bottom there, you'll realize that the average interest rate is the same, right? But on the left-hand side, the variable account after 10 years, uh, that 100,000 grows into 147,000 at an average rate of 7.5%. But on the right side in the indexed account, the same average rate of return actually nets him 50,000 more um, over 10 years. So, huh, that really strikes a light bulb in my head. How is it that two accounts same average interest rate, but one has more money than the other. Well, that's where Warren Buffett's rule comes in. He says, don't lose money. And you can see how indexing is a very powerful strategy. And we'll get into that. Um, number three, right, the uh, impact of inflation and taxes here. Well, average inflation right now in our country is about 3%. And historically, we're actually in a very low tax tax rate environment, right? And the question, I guess, begs uh, to be asked is, will taxes and inflation go up or go down in the future? Why am I bringing this up? Because a lot of times, you know, people are putting money into these uh, retirement accounts that are tax deferred. And they're going to get hit with taxes in the future, true? And we, quite frankly, don't know what taxes are going to be like in the future. And then, of course, inflation is another big thing with the government pumping trillions of dollars into our economy to save it from a total collapse. What do you think is going to happen to inflation down the road, right? Especially with the government uh, uh, not doing so well with our Social Security, Medicare, Medicare, all of those public uh, benefits, the pensions, they're all in trouble, right? And, and in my opinion, I think all of these things will severely impact um, our future dollars down the road. So let's get into it, guys. Let's talk about that first strategy, buy term and invest a difference. And let's uh, first discuss who advocates for this strategy. Well, uh, as you can see there, one of the most pro biggest proponents of this strategy is Dave Ramsey. And uh, I, I, I love the Dave Ramsey show. I love some of the advice that he gives. But keep in mind, Dave Ramsey is not a licensed agent. He is not a registered representative. He does not have any, uh, any compliance, any uh, governing body, anybody looking over his shoulder and making sure that his advice is sound advice right so he could say anything he wants to um, next of course you might have uh, heard of a company called Primerica which uh, ran with this strategy for a uh, couple decades as a matter of fact and um, the biggest one I think is your boss or your your corporate employer offering you the workplace benefits right they offer you the group term insurance they offer you the 401k and they're you're supposed to uh, uh, build wealth using those two methods and uh, of course the typical financial advisor will also recommend you this strategy now the theory is that buying term insurance is the most affordable option when it comes to life insurance right all the other other stuff is very expensive and mutual fund and 401k investments will produce higher interest rates and ultimately producing better results compared to the cash value growth inside of a permanent life insurance policy and the idea is to have enough money at the end to be able to i guess quote unquote self-insurance yourself right 
And so in practice, what I've noticed is that most of these retirement accounts, the mutual funds, the 401ks, they have significantly high fees. Ask yourself the question, do you know exactly how much in fees you're paying in your 401k? And I bet you you're not going to be able to find it in that fine print. Um, they do a really good job of burying it deep down there. And mutual funds, actually, uh, majority of them underperform the major stock indexes. They underperform the S&P, the NASDAQ, the Dow, a majority of the time. And these investments actually have no guarantees, right? So they're variable. They go up and down. And uh, the last thing is, right, when you get that term policy or that group policy, that's not yours. That's a rented life insurance. And it expires or it, it, you leave it behind when you leave your work. And that kind of leaves you uninsured later on in life when you are less likely to be insurable in the first place. And, you're be, and you might have a health challenge down the road when you're in your late 50s and 60s. So um, finally, during the distribution phase, when it comes to taking out that money, like I mentioned earlier, taxes are owed as ordinary income, right? And we don't know what the future tax rate is going to be like. So um, that is the buy term and invest a strategy, invest a different strategy. Now, what about index universal life? This is something uh, uh, that's not spoken about too often. It's a little lo known strategy and very few agents and brokers advocate it. The ones that understand it will advocate for it. The ones that don't won't, won't touch it. And um, believe it or not, the majority of people who use these plans are high net worth individuals, the wealthy class, the affluent class, right? And in theory, although it is less affordable than a term insurance policy, permanent life insurance policies that have cash value, that have a cash value component that's crediting interest based on you know a market index like the S&P or, or the Dow, um, they'll produce similar or even better results than a 401k or a mutual fund and term insurance combination. And the real results show during the distribution phase and not the accumulation phase. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that when when you're getting getting an illustration, you're seeing how this thing performs, you're only looking at the total amount being accumulated at the age of 60, 65. You're not really being shown what it's going to look like when you decide to uh, take the money out and, and distribute it, right? And so in practice, the main concern with these permanent life insurance policies is the higher premiums, right? You are paying a pretty penny for them. And the perceived uh, rising cost cost of the insurance and the caps on the interest rates are also another concern for people. So what most people don't realize is that IULs actually have a flexible premium option. You can pay less, pay more, and maybe down the road pay nothing. And that cost of insurance that people are, are so stickler about, you can actually control that. In some case, you can reduce and eliminate that totally down the road. And the trade-off for that cap rate is the fact that there is a guaranteed floor in most cases, and that's at 0%. So remember the slide I showed you before, the comparison between variable and index? Um, this is the index plan that offers you a guarantee of floor of 0%, means that um, you have the upside potential without the downside risk. And the secret weapon in this type of strategy is going to be the tax-free distribution via those policy loans. And we'll talk about all that stuff, but let's get right into it. I'm going to skip over this benefits slide and maybe come back to it at the end. But I really want to crunch the numbers for you and show you what this looks like. And uh, let's talk about the scenario we're going to use. We're going to use a scenario of 30-year-old twins. Both are going to be married. Both are going to have the same household income level, and they're both going to have a budget of $12,000 a year that they can set aside. And both are going to have the same expenses, and they're pretty much nearly identical, uh, pun intended, in every way, with one exception. The brother A, he's going to put his savings into a 401k with underlying investments in the stock market, and he's going to insure himself with a term life policy. And brother B is going to put his savings into an index universal life policy. So um, ultimately, I guess my goal here is today for, is for you to decide whether you want to be brother A or you want to be brother B, right? And so let's talk about brother A, scenario one, um, buying term and investing difference. So we got a 30-year-old healthy male here, and his goal is going to be to earn 70000 a year at the age of 60. Um, the rate of return we're going to use in that mutual fund is going to be 7.05%. And I've given the benefit of the doubt and not included fees in this plan. And I guarantee you those fees, they, they rack up a pretty number down, down the road 20, 30 years later. So we're not using fees in this example. So already I am biased towards the mutual fund. Um, they're also going to get a 30-year term life policy for half a million dollars issued at a preferred rating. And that policy is going to cost 500 bucks a year. Very, very affordable. 
And the contributions, you know, minus that uh, term policy, uh, 11500 a year are going to go into that tax deferred account. Um, and the future distributions we're going to assume are going to be taxed at 30%. So down there, you'll notice those are some of the resources I used, uh, bankrate.com and uh, some of the term life quoting softwares that I have access to. And let's talk about that term life policy real quick. Here's, here's the screenshot. Um, just so you know, I'm not making these numbers up. Down there, you'll see 44 bucks a month or 515 annually and face amount, of course. Um, this policy actually is a, a very, very incredible policy, but we'll not get into that. But let's move right along and look at the numbers here. Those red box highlights the uh, input that I've set there. The uh, uh, red box down here shows how much the money, how much this plan will produce in 30 years. This is a breakdown of the table, and this is the distribution calculator. So I have not made up any of these numbers. All I've done is use the, the, the tools and resources at your disposal and my disposal. You can go to bankrate.com and plug in these exact numbers, and you'll find the exact same results. So here is my summary findings of this strategy. So first of all, the out-of-pocket cost, including taxes, of this strategy is going to be a million bucks, a little, you know, north of a million bucks. And by the age of 60, this person will have accumulated about $1.17 million, and he can begin, begin distributing 100000 a year. Now, why are we distributing 100000 a year is because uh, we're using that uh, tax rate of 30%, right? And that's going to net him $70,000 after taxes. So uh, pulling out that money is going to last him 22 years. And so guess what? 60 plus 22 means that this guy in his early 80s is going to be stuck on Social Security and ultimately he's going to have no life insurance and nothing's going to be left for his heirs. So the total wealth created using this method is about $1.15 million. So um, not too shabby. Now, that being said, let's talk about Brother B and his scenario when he's using the Index Universal Life Policy. So same, same situation. His goal is the same 70000 a year. Um, rate of return is the same, 7.05%. And actually, we've included all of the fees that you would pay uh, for having this Universal Life Policy. And those fees include the cost of insurance, the premium expense charges, um, all of that, right? And so the contributions are going to go into all of the contributions are going to go into this policy, 12000 a year, and they're going to be contributions that have already been taxed. So you're going to put in after-tax dollars in this policy um, because your future distributions are going to be tax-free. Now, I've also included um, the taxes that you would have to pay on those contributions of 5000 a year, right? You're going to have to be fair with with taxes right so we pay taxes up front versus taxes later so the only resource that i used here was in iul policy illustration software again provided by one of the companies that i'm appointed with and here is a screenshot of that i of course blocked out the company's name so we're not uh, triggering any compliance issues and as you can see there the 12,000 a year contributions are going in for the first 30 years the rate of return is set at 705 um, here you'll see the 70,000 coming out uh, from that policy every single year all the way up until he's 100 years old. So let's get into the summary findings because here is where your mind I think is going to be blown because my mind was blown. So the out-of-pocket cost including taxes of this strategy is half of what it would cost you to have that mutual fund term combo. So you're paying only half a million dollars out of pocket for this strategy. And by age 60, this person will have about the same amount of accumulated money, 1.19 million, uh, and can begin distributing 70,000 a year. So he only has to take out 70,000 a year, not the 100, because all of that money is coming out already tax tax-free um, through a policy loan. So since he's paid income taxes, like I mentioned, all that distribution is coming out tax-free. And the income will last him 40 years and beyond until age 100. And after his passing, let's say he passes away at age 100, a $4 million death benefit would be inherited by his family, creating generational wealth. And the total wealth created using this method is $6.5 million. Wow. Now... You tell me which strategy you'd like to take advantage of, and let's dive right into these comparison charts. So let's look at the accumulated value comparison. 
uh, the yellow uh, orange line is going to be the IUL, blue line is going to be the mutual fund, and you can see how at age 60 the mutual fund begins to lose principal value. And you can also see how the IUL continues to grow beyond age 60. And this is quite frankly for, for the simple reason of participating policy loans. That means when you take out money out of this plan via a loan, the principal balance never drops down a penny. Your entire balance stays intact and continues to earn that 7% interest rate over time. Um, let's look at the death benefit comparison, right? The blue line is the term, expires at age 60. You see that's why that's got that sharp drop off. Uh, but for the IUL, the death benefit continues to grow as the policy's accumulated value continues to grow. The costs comparison, right? Of course, here is where the mutual fund term combo wins up front because you're not paying taxes uh, now, you're paying them later. But look at what happens after the age of 60, 65. Those, ta those costs skyrocket because um, down the road, you're going to end up having to pay taxes on all of your uh, uh, all of your money coming out of that mutual fund or that 401k. So finally, let's look at the distribution comparison. You can see how the blue line, the mutual fund runs out at age 80, uh, 82. And you can also see how the IUL runs well into the hundreds and beyond. So here is the final summary comparison in a table format. You can see how um, on one side you have the benefits of a tax deferral. You got no cap on the growth. Um, you have flexible premiums. You do have a low cost life insurance and you may borrow from that 401k for some reasons. It is liquid um, and there is possibly a company match to kind of help you out there. But ultimately, the lifetime rate of return this guy is getting is only 115%. And he's paying a total of $650,000 in taxes uh, during the lifetime of this plan. And on the IUL side, and he look at the IUL side, he has tax redistributions. He has that guaranteed floor. Um, he's got flexible premiums. He's got a death benefit all entire life. Long-term care, chronic illness, critical illness, terminal illness riders. Um, and all this bypasses probate and is creditor protected. And ultimately that... Uh, half a million investment returned him a uh, 1200% return. Now, uh, again, I must make a note that IULs are not an investment. They are an insurance policy that has a cash value component in there that functions like a savings that earns interest. I must stipulate that. And so ultimately, I guess you need to decide which strategy you'd like to take advantage of. And here's another, you know, bar chart breakdown of everything we discussed. And I think uh, through this presentation, you might realize that there's a reason why they don't tell you about your, about indexed universal life at your workplace. And there's also a reason why they push uh, group term insurance and, and 401ks to you at your workplace. Uh, a lot of uh, proponents of the IUL policy, quite frankly, I believe, do not understand how they work and do not understand how flexible of a product this is and how incredible of a product this is, if it is designed properly. So that is the one important takeaway from all of this. If you are considering an index universal life policy, my advice to you would be to seek out someone who you can trust because of the mere fact that these are flexible products and can be designed in any one way. You might end up with an agent who is more concerned about his commission rather than the mission of helping you. And you might end up with a policy that was not designed properly and then ends up imploding on you down the road. And of course, that is the, another big concern of, uh, of people people who are uh, who steer away from this type of, uh, of concept but I believe if you end up finding the right agent someone who can uh, who can guide you and, and design a policy to work for your benefit and not their pocket you might end up with something that could help you create generational wealth and set your family and your last name apart from the rest and so with this I want to appreciate all of you for being on this call today if you do have questions feel free to drop a comment uh, in the comment section below and we'll make sure to answer them and everybody Take care. Bye-bye.